Hi, and welcome back to my videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the past two videos, we've looked at two thermodynamic quantities that tell us whether or not a chemical process can occur spontaneously. Those properties are the Helmholtz free energy, which is measured under conditions of constant volume and temperature, and the Gibbs free energy, which is measured at constant pressure and temperature. However, many chemical processes occur under conditions where all three of those properties, pressure, volume, and temperature, may not be constant. How can we determine features of a chemical reaction, like the entropy or the free energy, when that's the case? To find out, let's look at four of the relationships we've seen in the last few videos. Here are equations for the Helmholtz free energy, Gibbs free energy, the overall energy, and the enthalpy. In order to understand how to use these equations to determine the properties of a chemical process, even under conditions of changing temperature, pressure, and volume, it's important to keep one important thing in mind. All four of the properties on the left sides of these equations are state functions. That means that the change in A, G, U, or H when we go from an initial state to a final state will be the same no matter what process was used to get from the initial state to the final one. So, for example, let's think about the change in the Helmholtz free energy. Ordinarily, we'd measure this under conditions of constant volume and temperature. Suppose we do perform a chemical process under those conditions. We can depict that process on a plot of pressure versus volume like this. We start at one pressure, volume, and temperature and hold the volume and temperature constant, but the pressure can change. Although it's not on this graph, the number of moles of the compounds in the reaction might change between the initial and final states too. Anyway, suppose we measure the change in the Helmholtz energy during this process and find out that it has a certain value delta A. Now suppose we perform another process, starting at those same initial conditions. However, this time we don't hold V and T constant during our process. Instead, the pressure, volume, and temperature might all change several times. In fact, this might not even represent just one chemical reaction. Instead, this time we might be performing two, three, or twenty different reactions. However, at the end of that long sequence of events, the final state of the system is exactly the same as the final state was for the first experiment we tried. We end up at the same volume and temperature where we started, and with the same ultimate products that we ended up with for the first experiment. In that case, the overall Helmholtz free energy, delta A, would be exactly the same as it was for the first experiment. The reason is because delta A is a state function, not a path function. So we always get the same value for delta A for any process, as long as we have the same initial and final states for the two different paths. And that's true for all four of these properties. For example, if we measure the change in Gibbs free energy for a process under conditions of constant pressure and temperature, that will also be the same Gibbs free energy for any process that has those same initial and final conditions, even if the path we choose doesn't have a constant pressure and temperature throughout the process. So, with that in mind, let's see how we can use these four equations to come up with new relationships. Let's look at the equation for the Helmholtz free energy first. Notice that this equation contains dt and dv on the right side. We can use this fact to write a new expression if we use something called a total derivative. That's a mathematical object you might never have encountered before, so let's talk about what a total derivative is for a minute. Suppose we had a function called f that contains three different variables, x, y, and z. We want to know how f varies with respect to another variable, such as t. We do that by taking the total derivative of f with respect to t. The total derivative of f is defined as the partial derivative of f with respect to x times the derivative of x with respect to t plus the partial of f with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to t plus the partial of f with respect to z times the derivative of z with respect to t. So in other words, we take the partial derivative of f with respect to each of the variables, 
each time multiplying by the derivative of the variable with respect to the new variable that we're differentiating f with respect to. Notice that each of the partial derivatives has variables that are being held constant, and these are written as subscripts. This is probably a little easier to grasp if I give you an example. Suppose we have a function f, which is equal to r squared times sine theta times e to the power phi. We want to determine the derivative of f with respect to another variable, t. To do that, we need to take the total derivative with respect to t. So, using the equation we saw before, we take the partial of f with respect to r times dr dt, plus the partial of f with respect to theta times d theta dt, plus the partial with respect to phi times d phi dt. That's what the total derivative is. Notice that since we know what the function f is, we can determine each of those three partial derivatives. The partial with respect to r is 2r sine theta e to the phi. The partial with respect to theta is r squared cosine theta e to the phi. And the partial with respect to phi is r squared sine theta e to the phi. So, now that we understand how a total derivative works, we can apply that to the function a, the Helmholtz free energy. a has two variables, temperature and volume. So if we take the total derivative of a, we get this. Now, let's compare that equation for the total derivative to the expression that we already have for the Helmholtz free energy. If we compare them, we can see that the partial derivative of a with respect to t is equal to negative s, and the partial with respect to v is equal to negative p. Now our second step will be to differentiate each of these by the other variable. In other words, we differentiate the first quantity with respect to v, and the second one with respect to t. That gives us the negative of the partial derivative of s with respect to v in the first expression, and the negative of the partial derivative of p with respect to t in the second expression. The left-hand side of each expression is called a cross derivative. A cross derivative is simply a second derivative where each differentiation is with respect to a different variable. In the first expression, we differentiated with respect to t first, and then with respect to v. And in the second expression, we did the differentiation in the opposite order. It turns out that for a continuous function, the value of the cross derivative is the same no matter what order the differentiations take place in. So, since the Helmholtz free energy is a continuous function, these two cross derivatives are equal to each other. If we set them equal to each other, we get this equation. This kind of equation, which we got by setting the two cross derivatives equal to each other, is called a Maxwell relation. It turns out that Maxwell relations are a useful way of expressing the connections between properties that are difficult to measure, such as the entropy, and more easily measured properties, like temperature, volume, or pressure. So, this equation is especially useful because it allows us to determine the entropy by monitoring changes in pressure, volume, and temperature. What's even better is that this expression works even for real gases, not just ideal gases. That hasn't been true for some of the equations we looked at in earlier videos. So, we got this Maxwell relation by starting with our original equation for the Helmholtz free energy. We can get other Maxwell relations by starting with each of the other three equations we mentioned. All we have to do is remember the three steps we used. First, determine the total derivative of the function we're looking at. Next, set the partial derivatives equal to a variable in the original equation. And finally, take the cross derivatives for each expression and set them equal to each other. For example, let's try that for this equation, the Gibbs free energy. We'll start by writing the total derivative, 
this time using t and p as the variables. When we do, here's what we get. If we compare this equation to the one we already had for Gibbs free energy, we find out that the partial of g with respect to t is equal to negative s, and the partial with respect to p is equal to v, the volume. Next, we'll take cross derivatives. We differentiate the first expression with respect to p, and the second one with respect to t, which gives us this. Since g is a continuous function, these two cross derivatives are equal to each other, which gives us this equation. This is another Maxwell relation. Again, it connects the entropy to the pressure, volume, and temperature of our system, all of which are pretty easy to measure. Now let's move on to this equation for the change in energy. We'll take the total derivative of u, this time with respect to s and v. When we do, we get this equation. We can compare this equation to the one we already had for du, which shows us that the first partial derivative is equal to t, and the second one is equal to negative p. Now we'll take the cross derivatives. We differentiate the first expression with respect to v, and the second one with respect to s. We can set the two cross derivatives equal to each other because u is a continuous function. When we do, the equation we get is yet another Maxwell relation. Finally, let's perform this same process starting with our expression for the enthalpy. Just as before, we start by taking the total derivative of the enthalpy with the variables s and p this time. When we do, here's what we get. If we compare this expression to the original equation for enthalpy, we can set the partial derivatives to variables in the equation. The first partial derivative is equal to t, and the second one is equal to v. Finally, we'll take the cross derivative for each of these expressions. We'll take the first one with respect to p, and the second with respect to s. Now we set the two cross derivatives equal to each other, which gives us our fourth and final Maxwell relation. So, to summarize, we've derived these four Maxwell relations by starting with our four equations for thermodynamic quantities. As we'll see soon, these four equations are especially useful in determining the entropy in situations where properties like the pressure or volume are being allowed to vary instead of being held constant. But we'll do that in the next video, because we've covered a lot of new material today. I hope you'll join me for that video. But until we meet again, have a good week.